A little while ago, Aaron, also known as Maven Fiction, came down to the studio and we captured a conversation we had in the live room. I've split the conversation up into three parts. And in this part, part two, we talk about recording, capturing the right performance, mixing in gear and committing to the recording. Okay, let's get into the more, um, I don't know what the word is, but the more intrinsic, you know, why why we're here sort of thing. So I think like, you know, when I did a lot of pop-based stuff with, you know, my background and, and stuff and working with the label and stuff, it was like, there was a lot of samples, there was a lot of quick decisions and it was a lot of like recycled stuff that we knew would get results quick and we knew it would produce this particular track and it, it it didn't strip all the character or anything they, they still had some characters because they were well mixed good producers but it it did definitely take out an element that you know as someone who grew up in bands doing this sort of stuff and it definitely like it changed the process you know it didn't want better it wasn't worse but it was different it, and, it, yeah. yeah and i think if this is your world that you love then this is the world that you love in it I th- yeah I th- i'm still a big fan of like you know like a band at least getting the kind of the rhythm section down playing together in a room uh, and it may be that you're dropping in and, and, and changing a couple of notes or um, you know you may be taking a, a verse and a chorus from one the take and, and, and splicing it together with another but it's I definitely like you know like like that idea of at least starting with that kind of that feeling of, 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 of a band um yeah, and uh, do, you, do you do a lot of supplementing with with like samples and stuff on your kicks and your snares? Yeah, yeah. I, I know everyone, <laughs> everyone does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, everyone does, and I think that that you know that is important, especially like you know Chad Blake will always add his low end of the sample. Yeah, you know? I, 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 and who are we to question Chad? We Blake? have to now. I think you have to now. Uh, what's expected from a kind of a, a record uh, or recording now? Uh, what's expected from a mix is definitely it's different. Like I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't get away with with you know like like out of tune vocals now. Whereas you know you listen to Twist and Shout by the Beatles and there's there's pitch issues all over it. I, I, that, the, but it even, it's context of time, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because even if you so, sang in pitch in that time, the tape would probably throw something yeah, out yeah, at some point. Yeah, you know, like and you'd get stuff there. So exactly, and again, instruments having to be bang on in tune. I mean, you know, watching the the Get Back documentary, like I'm sure everyone did. You know, everyone's tuned into the piano in the room, which isn't necessarily a concert, and it's 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 just an interesting way of doing it now. So yes, I mean, I try and capture the drum kit in the room as much as possible and use as much as I can of it. But like, if if I need to throw an extra sample on the kick or even replace the kick because it just didn't suit the song, um, like you know, I'm not against it. Like whatever, no, really. It's, it's about serving the song, like exactly. we said. It? It's about serving yeah. the song and, and serving I mean, the listener. And serving serve the, the listener yeah. and, and what's expected. Yeah, um, that's it. Um, and plus, you know, nowadays, you know, we, we've alluded to this in conversations as well. Like things that things have to translate outside of what they would have normally, you know, like outside of a hi-fi or outside of big speakers or outside of what you're doing in there. They have to translate onto a tiny little smartphone or something and some really poor speakers. Yeah. I think if anything, it's like yeah, it's it, there's more. What you listen to it on is more diverse now than than ever before. And you, and you're dealing with you're dealing with non, audio files listening to tracks as well. Like I always remember getting in, to a car, and they'd boosted the low end right up, and I was like, what if you you know we were just listening we weren't listening to anything that warranted a low end of that proportion, and I was saying like, what have you done? Why have you turned that right up? And and it's that mentality of well I just they just know to boost low end they bass don't know what that yeah <laughs> bass, yeah well I I remember listening to a again just on that note because we haven't really spoke about your outbog yet but we we can maybe get inside in that room but 
I remember listening to it could have been your it could have been your Chad Blakes or your Sean Everett's. It was someone like that of that nature. They were talking about how you know people get really caught up on what preamp and compressor and things like that they're using. But by the time the full mix is complete, it doesn't matter how good of a producer you are. You couldn't like pr just provide someone with a record and then be like, "What compressor did they use?" Do you know what I mean? And even and I know some like a fair child does a thing that only a fair child does. But by the time it's gone through your you you mix and your master process, you can't even ident you'd never identify that fair child in a mix. Yeah. Would you? Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's just interesting, isn't it? You know, that, that people get so caught up on those decisions and that gear. You can have the best kit in the world and capture it at a really high fidelity. But if the performance isn't great, you've just captured a poor performance really, really well. Yeah, even yeah. So like, it's almost like, um, you know, the, the kind of the operation of the tools, like and what tools you choose should be at a certain standard and you should be at a certain competence to be able to do it but th I think the trick is getting the actual performance right and that's what a great producer does isn't it uh, it's knowing which is the great performance like and, and actually honing in on that mm -hmm. with the added kind of the added sparkle of, of, a, of a great yeah. a great song like recorded brilliantly is 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 is, is, is going to be fantastic a great song recorded poorly is going to be good it's still going to be, you're still going to hear it's a good song. Um, a terrible song recorded really well, it's, it's, it's still going to be, you're just going to hear it really well. From yeah, the mic. Yeah. So, so it is, it is that, that, that kind of element. Um, so I think it is, it's striking that balance. Um, again, it's, it's like, so, like a lot of the time when you are, you know, if you're using a great, like a preamp going into a fantastic compressor, and you're doing it in real, like, you know, as you're recording and as you're printing it down and if you're committing to it, that'll add to the vibe. Yeah. That a singer will hear that it's a great sound in preamp and the voice sounds fantastic and the compressor's doing its thing um, and that, that, that might aid a, aid a better performance. So so I think it's it's like, you know, having great tools is is, is part of it, but it's, it's, it's serving the song, it's serving the performance, it's making sure that, that what you capture is that magic. Um, and it's as much as about like the gear, like like we've alluded to and we we're talking to earlier on. It's about having the right vibe to do it in. Because if you're in the right headspace and you're in that kind of creative creative space, then 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 it's going to be a lot easier to to hit those kind of points and uh, that performance. Definitely, I think like the workflow thing is a massive thing that I've come to realise is like the the biggest difference between me creating something phenomenal and me just like going through the motions and like it's about finding like a workflow that you know with with the stuff that I did online and then I get loads of people asking me questions of like what how do you do this and how do you do it and like it wouldn't it wouldn't serve it wouldn't suit them you know like because you have to find that workflow that really suits your personality do you know what I mean like, definitely you know, like I've said to you before I can't stay focused on one thing for very long also like I have to move quickly or I'm I'm gone and I'm onto something new and, and that never gets done and, and that's so for you it's about, about removing friction that's like, it and and that's why tactile things again because of the way my brain works tactile things work really well when I'm staring at the computer all the time you know I can, I can get a good result I don't enjoy it so then I'm zoned out and then I'm not creative and then I'm gone whereas if it's tactile and like some of these some of these bits of outboard gear and things like we spoke about UAD and I, I love that UAD world and the stuff that I'll never be able to afford that like Fairchilds and stuff but like the my belly's rumbling but the uh, like the things that I can't afford there but the, the UAD plugins sound very very good I can't tell you whether they sound exactly the same because yeah. I've never used the original <laughs> Fairchild it doesn't matter it doesn't matter at all because they're getting what I think, result. yeah, I think even, like, I don't think it's, I think it's almost irrelevant on whether or not they sound exactly the same. Because yeah. again, Fairchild, it's a little bit like the Hammond organ. Every Fairchild's going to sound slightly differently because it's been used for less different, like the time and the amount of and tubes the performance. And yeah. The performance. The performance go through it. But it, 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 but does it matter if it sounds different? As long as it sounds good. Yeah. Like, it, 
it's like that's kind of a little bit of kind of I think it's a little bit irrelevant. Like it's well, like Chad Blake will say, and I know I talk about him all the time, but he's my hero. But Chad Blake will always say that like he'll do everything in the box, and he'll be like, you know, he's worked with tape consoles for years. He'll do everything in the box for the most part, and he'll say like, I'll be putting tape emulations on, and he'll be like, it don't sound like tape. It don't matter because I don't want it to sound like tape. Or I'd go put it on tape. tape. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I want it to sound like this new thing that that is pushing and evolving music. Otherwise, all songs would sound the same, captured the same. I think sometimes with a tape emulation, it is a case that it sounds like a kind of a hyper tape. Like it's like it's like a characterization of what tape is. Um, whereas I think a lot of the time with uh, with with tape, it was doing. It was doing that, but it was doing it in a lot more of a kind of a subtle way, which was a build up over several yeah. tracks of tape. So, and, and that's what all of this is. Yeah. You know, all that mixing is like making very minor adjustments that combine, yeah. compound into something brilliant. Like, you know, it, I think mixing and producing is rather than, I mean, YouTube will have you believe that it's, it's one magic pill I'll, I'll, I'll do, like I'll, I'll make this, this one thing I'll, I'll, I'll make your mixes like elevate it when in reality it's 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 two two hundred or more little incremental things that 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 make the difference. It's just it's just saturate everything in it. I'll say it just saturate everything beyond the that's marketing. <laughs> it's more saturation. <laughs> I think, but but I mean if you go back if you go back to like you know again we can't always apply techniques from the past to the to now because what we expect as a as a consumer or a listener is different from what we would expect um you know 20 30 40 years ago but um there was something about running um through a console with a load of transformers and electronics to a tape machine which again had transformers electronics back through the console to mix it back to the outboard gear and there was a there was a kind of there was uh, there was there was artifacts and kind of you know um, added harmonics and and loads of different elements that were were added within the, this kind of process. So um, the there is something for what you were just saying there of adding saturation because that would have been happening in the older process. It's almost like you know the computer process is almost gone. Not too clean, but it's got it's definitely got a, a sound that we that I think increasingly people are trying to to lean away from. Um, but I do think you know, jokes aside, it is it is a lot of that that people miss out. You know, creating new harmonics in sounds. You know, like by saturating or distorting all because oh. that, that's all you're doing. Isn't it? You know, creating them harmonics and and then that allows it to translate and sit differently and and, and stuff. So. But like the the tape stuff, I know you've obviously got a, a phenomenal tape machine. The matching your desk and everything, and and that's really good. And again, Sean Everett, Warren Drugs, like you know, I absolutely love production style, and he he heavily leans into his tip. In fact, your studio is like a cleaner looking <laughs> version, of that in a lot of ways, which I can't believe it's on my doorstep. You know, you think you have to go see Sean Everett to get something like that, but like I think that there is something. Again, when we're talking about processes and feeling creative, there is something about utilizing that stuff that that takes you somewhere new. From a tracking perspective, uh, when I when I am recording and I've got a band or like several musicians in the room, we use the big mixing desk and we record in, and we may go to tape or we may go to Pro Tools. Um, that's kind of uh, like that's that's a, an artistic and a stylistic decision and a workflow decision. But regardless of what medium I'm, I'm recording to during tracking days, I'll I'll bring it back through the board. So there'll be all the faders there, and if someone wants to hear the bass guitar more, they'll be able to just grab hold of the fader and turn the bass guitar up. Um, for example, and I think that's that collaborative and that that tactile feel. It's not only quicker, but it means that, like that, that you don't have to wait for the the Pro Tools operator to to turn it up using the mouse on the software, and it gives you the opportunity to focus on what you're focusing on. It is, but I can say, just sit down, right? You know, you can you can turn these up and down, and this isn't gonna this isn't gonna ruin anything. You can't break it, uh, and it means that. Oh, how's that sound? Bang! Oh, yeah, sounds great, and it, it it just it aids that workflow, and that 
that feeling that everyone can like get hands on and actually like you know yeah feel and hear what's what's going on in the music as well so definitely i think like as well the the summit the summit nice about committing things early doors you know making a decision like we're saying with the mics like we're saying with stuff like this get making those decisions early doors and committing to those decisions musicians have commitment issues don't they so like i think like if you in this world that we're in now you've just got infinite options and decisions and it i don't think it does you any favors and i don't think it produces a better record i think it just means that you put off a decision until further down the line now again it depends it depends on what you do it depends like if i am producing or co-producing or working very closely with a producer um that i may we may lean into decisions like we might drive a mic preamp harder so we get some grit on the vocal going in that's got its place and that's great it just depends on what the final like output is if i've got someone and we're just tracking and someone else is going to mix it on the back end it may be that we do lean off that and we'll leave that decision up to that that point in the chain so i think it really depends really on on like kind of where where the recording or where the mix is going to go to next that, that kind of i suppose that's a sort of that's a sort of solely that comes with owning a studio like this as yeah. opposed to working we're, on we're getting yeah. Home. yeah home i would say 100 percent. if you're mixing it you're producing it i would say 100 percent committing um slightly different for me again like like i, like I just said it, it it depends on the project uh, i'm a great fan of it if 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 i know that i've got the freedom to make those decisions uh, or work with people to make the decisions. Well, you want to give people options. But though, yes, yeah. but like you know, if if I'm recording a drum kit in here, I may, I may go. You know what? It's a really he's a really balanced drummer, or she's a really balanced drummer. And we'll we'll set up the mics and the kit, and and I'll use a minimal setup because I know I've got the sound straight away. I can hear it come through the speakers. Yeah. If if we're tracking drums and we're doing a drum tracking day and we're tracking five or six tracks and it's 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 part of a bigger project. I might have you know twenty mic <laughs> set up around the drum kit because like yeah like I want to I want to give that option I don't want to box myself in and people say oh like you know you've committed to that and that that wasn't that wasn't the vision for the project so it's it's knowing your place within that kind of within that that, that project. How much do you like you know again I, I I mentioned to you earlier that I I've like had songs that I've taken to good producers and you know they've transformed it and it's better than I could ever imagine but it doesn't even mildly resemble what I went in with and I don't mind that you know I'm not precious over it. I I just want the outcome to be good in the moment you know and I, like I've said to you before I believe that you can you can record one song a hundred different ways and they all live in their own rights how 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 much do you sort of take ownership for that when an artist comes in will you will you sort of have that conversation early doors and sort of because you know like sometimes you will know better or what will serve a song than an artist will even if they've got this real rigid vision and I don't think that's healthy for music anyway yeah it it, it just depends it depends on on personalities it depends on on what I am I, I like kind of yeah at the outset like are, are we co-producing Am I producing it? Am I just engineering? Although, it because it's sometimes it's, it's about getting the terminology right, and it's about it's about understanding what what your part in this in this song is. Whereabouts do I sit? Like you know, sometimes I start off just being an engineer, and then realise that actually no, I'm heavily leaning into producing, and there's a lot of questions coming, and. Uh, and like, is this take better than that take? And and how do you feel about that? And it's 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 fine. I'm like I am, um, I'm, I'm happy to kind of fill all roles. But it is it is one of those things. And some projects evolve. Some people just want to record, and then they realise that there's a kind of relationship forms, and you end up seeing it throughout the whole project. 